invite you today to turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and look at the next profile of problems from the life of David. Today's message sounds around uh, facing Goliath. Is there a person in your life who puts you in fear? Is there a situation that you believe you cannot face? Is there one problem that you hope you never have to tackle in your lifetime? I remember as I would go and visit with, uh, with Murtis, with Faye's mom at uh, the villa. This week it would be, uh, I hope I never go deaf. That would be terrible. I couldn't take that if I went to death. And the next time I went to see her, she, oh, I, I pray the Lord I never go blind. That would be horrible if I went blind. And the next one was, I hope that my mind is always alert and active because I wouldn't want to be here and have a good body and a bad mind. And she always had something that she was praying would not come upon her. Maybe for you it's the, the C word, cancer. Yeah. Or the A word, Alzheimer's. It could be a parent or a spouse. It could be a fear of what your child might do or might have done. The teacher in the book of Ecclesiastes says it this way, there is nothing new under the sun. Now, there are new ways of doing it, but the things that we do, the rebellion that some of us undertake, is just the same as it's always been. The diseases, we've got new names for them, but they've been around for a long time. <coughs> there are no new diseases, no new situations, there are no new people. You see, people are always as they have always been. We have not, since the beginning of recorded time, evolved any better or any worse until Jesus. And then we didn't evolve so much as we were just transformed by the renewal that comes from having the Spirit of God within us. Everything you and I face today or tomorrow has been faced by someone before us. Every burden that you bear or that I may bear, every difficult person who assaults us or assails us is a type of one who has gone before us and someone has survived. Someone has overcome. Someone has made it through. Amen. Not many of us will rush into battle. Some of you did. 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Not many of us would rush into illness. Not many of us would choose that battle. Not many of us, in fact, are looking or fight. We're mostly pacifists, aren't we? <laughs> we try to avoid fights. Well, except the you know. <laughs> Still, somewhere along the way, the fight is going to come to us. The question we must answer is not whether we will fight but how we will fight. Not whether trouble will come, but how we will face trouble when it comes. You know the story of David and Goliath. First Samuel chapter 17 tells us, in fact, I touched on it briefly last week as we talked about David's humility. The army of Israel has formed a battle line against the Philistines. 
In their ranks is a giant of a man. Scripture says that Goliath stood nine feet tall. Now normally when the armies lined up against one another, they would engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat in those days. They didn't have um, guns. They may have arrows. They had shields as well. They would engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat until one of them won a decisive victory, until the lines collapsed, and then there would be a retreat, and maybe a return to battle the next day, and so on, until finally someone tucked their tail and ran. But because of Goliath's presence, the battleground changed. Imagine if you had a nine foot tall warrior on your side. You'd probably do what the Philistines did. They put him out front and said, we'll make a challenge, Israel. You have one man we have one man. They're both just men. Nine feet tall, five feet tall. They're both just men. Whoever wins that one battle determines the outcome of this entire war. It sounds good. It sounds really good. You know, only one person out of all of these men who have lined up, only one person is going to die. That's pretty good. Unless you're the one. <laughs> Unless you're the one. Goliath was confident. Scripture says his armor weighed 125 pounds. Try carrying that around for a little while. He was confident. He knew he wasn't going to be the one to die, so he challenged anybody on Israel's side. Come on out to the battlefield, and you and I will decide the war. And everybody on Israel thought that was a good idea as long as the king didn't pick them. Goliath came to the front line and he could shout to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will be your subjects. But if I overcome and kill him, you become our subjects. And then he says this. This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. This has been going on for day after day after day. And every time Goliath comes out, Israel retreats back to camp. What Goliath and the commander of the army of the Philistines have just done is change the tone and course of war. You see, normally, if you come with a thousand against ten thousand, you know it's highly unlikely you're going to win. Philistines put all their chips in one place. And they have the advantage of the biggest guy, and they should exploit him. That's just smart work. Now, having said that, though, the army of Saul wasn't just the army of Saul. It wasn't just the army of the nation of Israel. It was also the army of God. The army of God did not have to capitulate in terms of war. There was no negotiation on the, on the issue. When the Philistines made the challenge, the Israelites could have rejected it, and all of them came out onto the battle and attacked from the right flank or the left flank, they could have left Goliath to be the last man standing. But they didn't. Instead, Saul and the army were dismayed and terrified. The scripture says in chapter and verse 24, they all ran from him in great fear. They looked at the challenge and none of them was willing to go to battle with the fate of the whole nation on their backs. None of them 
was willing to go to battle with their own future facing the job. They thought, and probably rightly so, that they would die if they were chosen to battle this man. Let <coughs> us understand then that David's response is unusual. David's response may even be irrational. Would you volunteer? But David's response was inspired. Verse 32, David says, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. The end of the event was not a foregone conclusion in anyone's mind except David's. But you and I have read it so often, we know the end. We believe that it was a foregone conclusion. David faced the giant without the benefit of sword or armor or spear. All he had was a slingshot and five smooth stones and that was actually more than he needed. David said to the Philistine, verse 45, You come against me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over David takes one stone, slings it at the giant, hits him in the forehead and knocks him over. And then David takes the giant's own spear and cuts off his head. David wins the battle. Well, maybe I should rephrase that. God wins the battle. And David is just the weapon that God uses to win that. Now to ask you the question. Do you want to have the incredible thrill of victory? You know, there's only one way to know what it feels like to overcome against incredible odds. You have to meet the enemy on the field of battle. Until we're willing to engage the battle, we will never win. <clears throat> we may not lose, but we will never win. Right. John Maxwell says this, Success is due to our stretching to the challenges of life. Failure comes when we shrink from them. None of us will escape this life without facing challenges. I believe God grants to us challenges to give us opportunities to win. Is your challenge today financial? Medical? Is your challenge a relationship at work or at home? Every challenge involves a fear of the unknown. You don't know the outcome when you start. Success and failure come only in our response to the challenge. But we cannot win if we do not fight. We cannot overcome if we simply shrink away. It doesn't matter what cross you're called to bear. You still have to bear it. We must face it with dignity. Face it with courage. Face it with all of the zeal we can muster. But we must face it. We must face it with the knowledge that God is on our side. Face it with the promise that He will never leave us 
nor forsake us. When challenges come your way, your attitude oftentimes determines whether you win or lose. Attitude has a great influence on recovery from surgery or illness. Attitude has a great influence on victory or defeat. Elie Wiesel, the Jewish prisoner of war in the Nazi prison camps, says attitude played a role in those who survived the challenge of Auschwitz. Attitude has a high correspondence with those who survive the experience, who overcome, who accomplish. Paul writes to us from the New Covenant perspective, and he says this, I am convinced that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, if your challenge isn't in there, it ain't no man. It ain't no man. We have to face the challenges of life. We must face the Goliaths in this life. In the spring of 2006, in the little town of Russell Springs, Kentucky, population less than 2,500. Little place. Smaller than Ellisville. <laughs> smaller than Ellisville. Bigger than so so, but smaller than Ellisville. 2,500. The battle lines were drawn, and Megan Chapman. 18 years old has to make a decision. She was selected by her classmates as the person to give a prayer during graduation ceremonies. But somehow, the Goliath of our modern culture, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, picked a fight with Megan. They challenged in federal court this idea of praying at a graduation ceremony, even though the school didn't pick Megan, even though the school didn't say she would pray, her classmates chose her. The federal court granted their petition, and she was prohibited, and the school system was prohibited from having any prayer at their graduation ceremony. Russell Springs, Kentucky. Megan was concerned, but she wanted to stick with her convictions. Thankfully, the lawyers at Liberty Council, Liberty University School of Law, stepped in and the morning of graduation contacted Megan to let her know about her rights and the opportunities that she had. They said to her, you know, the court ruling says you can't pray. Doesn't say you can't talk about what's important in your life. Doesn't say you can't talk about the people and the places and the things that have meaning to you. Megan had already prepared a secular poem to give so she could be a good citizen. Megan had a twin sister. And her twin sister had a plan. She said, Megan, you may not be able to pray, but I printed up a hundred copies of the Lord's Prayer and passed them out to every graduating senior. And when Megan got up on the stage, before she ever said a word, everyone in the graduating class stood up and recited voluntarily the Lord's Prayer. Amen. And the crowd end of that prayer, stood up and gave an acclamation. Shouts clapping. And this Russell Springs has 2,500 people. There are 3,000 in attendance at the graduation ceremony. 
Megan takes the poem and puts it to the side, and she speaks from her heart about what Jesus means to her. She never prayed. And yet she witnessed to 3,000 people of her faith in Jesus. The next day, cover story on the Louisville Courier Journal, which goes out to about uh, 500,000 homes. Megan Chapman, Russell Springs High School. Several days later, she's contacted by Fox News and the head of Liberty Council, and she appeared on television, and they talk about what happened and why and how God used Megan Chapman. Some months later, Christiane Amanpour from CNN comes and does a piece on Megan Chapman for her series, God's Christian Word. Megan was dead. And the ACLU stood out on the field of battle and said, I defy the armies of Israel. I defy the army of God. I defy the army of Jesus Christ. But instead of being surrounded by those who hid in fear, Megan Chapman was surrounded by those who spurred her into battle. And she won the victory. The folks at Liberty Council were so impressed with her, they said, we'd like to offer you and your twin sister scholarships. Full ride to Liberty University. Dr. Jerry Falwell was still living, and when he found out about it, he said, he said, bring them on. We'll take it. Last May, 2013, Megan Chapman graduated a second time from Liberty University, this time with her Juris Doctor. She plans to practice law and eventually to challenge Roe versus Wade save the lives of unborn children. This is your battle. Megan didn't know when she went to the graduation practice that she was going to be asked to pray. She didn't know when she was asked to pray that the Goliath was going to come out and battle against her. She didn't know if she had the, the ability to, to fight and yet there were those who came alongside her and said, you can win this battle. You can make this change. You can have your voice. And she won. Your battle is not made for us. And your battle is still a fight to which God has called you. And you must make a choice whether you will couch in fear or whether you will stand in the battle with just a sling and a stone and let God take over. How will you stand? How will you? How can God?